Hey everyone, I am here with the founder of Johnny Guru, currently at Corsair. Yep. And what do you do at Corsair? I am the uh, director of Power Supply R&D. So we're going to be talking about power supplies. Of course. And this actually preempts something pretty big for us at Gamers Nexus. We're going to start testing power supplies pretty soon. I've received some training from Mr. John Giroux. Yeah, you, you know now just enough to be dangerous, yeah. That's right. And uh, <laughs> so the, the goal here is to talk about why should you care about power supply reviews? There aren't a lot of them on YouTube. Yep. At least not ones that go into depth with testing equipment. Yep. So we need to talk about why power supplies matter. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermal Grizzly, makers of the Conductonaut liquid metal that we recently used to drop 20 degrees off of our temperatures. Thermal Grizzly also makes traditional thermal compounds reused on top of the IHS, like cryonaut and hydronaut pastes. Learn more at the link below. So the whole reason I got into power supplies, even though I'm not an electrical engineer, you know, I have a computer background, first software, then hardware, um, is because of the lack of knowledge of what is in this mysterious black <laughs> box, right? Um, you know, so I, I got my hands on a load tester similar to this many years ago. Because um, what I found out was a lot of power supplies weren't able to do what they said they could do when you look at the label of the power supply. And a, a lot of what the power supply could do was also out of spec for what Intel expects your power supplies to do. Now, of course, this goes back to like 15 years ago when, you know, a, a power supply that had 150 millivolts of ripple on the 12-volt rail was not <laughs> uncommon yeah. uh, if you're paying like $20 for a 500-watt power supply. Um, so... Yeah, so I, I got myself a load tester like this um, and started loading up power supplies to whatever the label said and blew quite a few of them up. Uh, fewer now than before because I think everybody is now, you know, learning that there's a lot of garbage out there. Right. Um, so it's uh, it's been quite a quite a fun uh, quite a fun journey. <laughs> you know, I mean, we were talking about if we kind of give everyone a, a spectacle to start with. Yeah. Probably catastrophic failure is always a, a fun thing to yes. talk about. Yes. So when a power supply catastrophically fails, I mean, you read online about uh, a really good example is, for example, the, the 24 pin. If you load, say, I don't know, four GPUs into a motherboard, right. and you start pushing 75 watts to all the PCIe slots, yeah. suddenly you can melt the cables or something yeah, like that's, that. Yeah, that's one of our most recent uh, catastrophic catastrophic failures that we see, especially with all the cryptocurrency mining, right. is melted uh, pins because PSUs are pushing graphics cards running full load 24-7, and eventually, you know, that heat builds, builds up and those connectors start to melt. Right. Uh, they're just not engineered to do that in most cases. I mean, the power supplies can do it, but the problem is the cables, common sense you would think would dictate that you would want to spread those loads up across multiple cables and connectors. But unfortunately, there's quite a few people in there that are like, oh, I just want this to be neat and clean. I got one cable that's got six connectors on it. Let's use that. Right. And that's <laughs> when you run into problems. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so that's, that's one type. Uh, power supplies can go pop if you put yeah, them on. Yeah, that's, that's the really dramatic ones that I usually wish I have cameras running all the time on me 24-7. Yeah. Uh, and you never get used to it either. A power supply pops, you will jump. You could be doing this for 20 years. doesn't matter. Every engineer in here, power supply blows up right through the roof um, and and it's it's really spectacular when you do see it because even in the housing through the grill you're gonna see those sparks shoot through like the fan grill and stuff and typically that's because you have uh, MOSFETs that are overloaded um, whether on the PFC uh, the input voltage is too low so you're pushing more current through it can't handle it it blows up or on the uh, DC side mm. uh, you're just pushing too much power through it and it blows up and Again, spectacular flash of light and a very loud bang. Right. And uh, everybody in the room, you know, their heart skips a beat. And, <laughs> yeah. And you take an early lunch. And <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, so uh, what about for overclocking something we do a lot of, run into things where, for example, it's not uncommon to push 50 or 60 amps to, into a video card. Right. To, hopefully over multiple PCIe cables. Right, right? Like of course. Two of them or something. Right. Uh, so when you're talking about a situation like uh, overclocking, exiting spec, and you're dealing with a high amount of current through a cable, what kinds of uh, points of failure do you see there? I mean, wire gauge, yeah. right? Yeah, wire gauge is really, really important. Um, I mean, we make sure we specify wire gauge based on use case. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but copper is expensive, right? So you'll find a lot of power supplies out there where the wire gauge isn't thick enough to support sustain loads of a high-end graphics card. Um, so some of the uh, some of the negative uh, feedback from that is that, you know, 
obviously if the gauge is thinner, you're building up resistance, the voltage drops, you know, and, and it's just everything just goes haywire. Right. You know, the, the car doesn't get enough power, your efficiency drops, the power supply actually will potentially overload even because it's trying to push power to feed a card that's not getting as much power as it needs because there's just too much resistance in this low gauge wire. So it's just that, that that's something that's really often overlooked, but it can really cause a lot of problems. Uh, but, you know, it's, and again, it's kind of the same problem as when you load too many cards or too many riser cards in the case mm -hmm. of cryptocurrency mining, you know, onto a single cable. You know, it's too much power. It's being fed into a single wire at the power supply, and that's just going to cause so much resistance that heat builds up. I've measured like 160 degrees Celsius at a single connector pin, and then, yeah, you, you, it's no wonder you start seeing black plastic just yeah. melting off the power supply. Yeah. Yeah, th and that alone is, once we get into power supply testing, Fully, that's something I want to explore because we see a lot of. I mean, I get tweets from people all the time where we'll see like melted connectors to riser cards. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, it's really not a big question why it melted, <laughs> right? It's surprising you, that people actually are surprised that they melted sometimes yeah. <laughs> when they do. Um, and and you and you know, it's it's funny is and, and up until recently when cryptocurrency mining became so big for everyone, you know, everybody wants to you know get on board that train that I've really learned a lot about the UL94V flammability rating of plastic <laughs> and the additives that are required to put into the plastic so it just melts and right. doesn't burst into flames. Right. So that's, yeah, <laughs> it, every day is a, 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 a learning experience. Right. <laughs> so what, let's talk about this thing we have behind us here. Yeah, yeah. So we have two units. We've got a power supply over there. It's a Corsair HX850. Mm -hmm. That's currently hooked up to this, which is an SM8800. Sun Moon SM8800, yep. The auxiliary load's called an SM22, uh, sorry, 220, uh, because you can run the 8800 by itself, but what you have here is four of the loads are actually up here, and because they had all this extra real estate, they give you uh, a little extra power meter here, so you don't have to have a separate power meter to measure the power of the power supply. So what we end up with is 10 loads here, uh, six of them are 12 volt, and then you have a 5 volt, 3 3 volt, negative 12 volt, and a 5 volt standby. Um, and it will tell you your voltages, your wattages on each of these rails, and then the current that you have programmed into the load tester. And then, like I was saying about the extra real estate up here for another display, this tells you your AC information. So you have your AC voltage, wattage, current, frequency, that's all in there. So you can use that to calculate efficiency if you look at, like, for example, the DC load, and then divide, or take your AC load and divide by your DC load, then you, on, right off the bat, you know your efficiency. Right. Yeah, and we can use one of these to do all types of validation, mostly checking to make sure the label on the power supply is exactly. accurate or truthful. Yeah. And uh, there are also options like you showed us a power good button. Yeah, that your, shows your power good signal. So, so you know like the power good uh, signal of your uh, power supply. Which is, I guess, basically a response time of some kind? It's, yeah, it's exactly. It's uh, the, how long it's waiting for the motherboard to feedback that it's ready for power, for, right. for power from the power, su power supply. Sure. Yeah. And uh, is that read back in milliseconds, I guess? And it's read back in milliseconds, yeah. So then it, I guess the implication is if that number is too high, the motherboard might not fully If it's do too high, the motherboard misses it and says, well, there's just the power supply is not ready. It's, right. There must be something wrong with the power supply. Right, yeah. right. And then uh, other options. So we can program a load in here. Yep. Uh, so we can program, for example, uh, you could put 20 amps on a PCIe cable or something if you wanted to. And uh, basically the point of that is to run through validation, make sure. Right, yeah. So you, you can either take your loads and distribute it across the 6, 12 volt rails and just to test the capability of the power supply. Mm -hmm. But also if you want to do something like, you know, we were talking about what is the load capability or what kind of voltage drop are you going to see right. on a single connector. If you load a single connector, you can load each of these rails up to, you know, you can zero everything out and load one up to like 40 amps if you wanted to. Right. Just to see what happens. And if we hook up an oscilloscope to this as well, yeah. we can start getting things like Ripple. Yeah. Yeah, you just uh, hook your oscilloscope up to here, set it to uh, measure AC, and uh, by turning this dial here, you're going to be able to measure the ripple on each of the rails on the power supply. Right, right. And that, I guess, we, we should note why ripple is important, too, because, uh, I don't know, there's not a lot of power supply videos on YouTube. Yeah. So, <laughs> so uh, ripple, I'll say from an overclocking standpoint, then you can tell me from an engineering standpoint. Okay. But from my perspective, with ripple and uh, Buildzoid, who works with us, if you start getting into a category where the ripple's really high, you can have potentially stability issues or, right. or just power delivery issues in general. Right. Which is... Or both. Right, or both, <laughs> which, uh, again, my experience, practical experience is more, uh, is more noticeable or observable with a highly sensitive overclock or something like that. 
but how about how well, about it, your it does affect overclock more than anything because it is so sensitive at that point. Um, obviously, Intel they only want it to be within 120 millivolts, but mm. of course, Intel is working within the specifications they designed their chips for, right? Right. Um, but obviously, I mean, Ripple is AC current that is passed through to the DC side, and being that power supplies are what they call switch mode power supplies, where you're switching the frequency mm. of the AC, um, you're actually creating Ripple uh, to the AC current and then bringing that through the power supply. So uh, it's even more of a problem with switch mode power supplies than anything else. Um, you know, darn Tesla. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, so anything that's not filtered by the power supply, because that's what it's up to, is, is just the power supply has to be able to filter it before it sends it out. Um, it's going to end up going to the voltage regulators of whatever you're running, right? Right. So that's the CPU, the GPUs, and then, like you were saying, if you overclock it, it's even more sensitive to that. And so the more there is to it, the more it has to deal with it on its end. It's much easier to deal with on the power supply end. Sure. Because we have all this space to you know, throw a bunch of caps in there, filter, is that, you know, filter it out as much as possible. Right. So then if I'm reading reviews on power supplies or watching them, uh, where do we classify exceptionally good ripple yeah, versus yeah. acceptable versus unacceptable? So uh, personally, I, I find uh, acceptable, like for like Joe end user, mm -hmm. it would be like 60 millivolts. Uh, 20 millivolts is usually the goal for Corsair. Uh, just so, you know, it reviews well more than anything. But right. also, you know, we do sponsor a lot of overclockers. And, and even the ones that we don't sponsor, they, they like, you know, I'll go to a show and they're using Corsair power supplies because um, the power supply is not part of the equation of why they're having problems overclocking, mm -hmm. you know, whatever they're overclocking because we do set such, uh, you know, goals uh, to, to bring Ripple down. I mean, something like the AXI, for example, that ripples down to 15 millivolts by spec. You know, so different testers will get different results, but we basically, um, we, we ax it if it's anything higher than 15 millivolts. So, uh, but like I said, for Joe end user, 60 millivolts, uh, but you know, really good power supply should be 20 millivolts. And at what point does it, does it become noticeably unacceptable to an end user? I mean, when do you start really seeing problems? Well, to, actually to an end user, to be perfectly honest, it's, it's not, it shouldn't be, uh, it shouldn't be noticeable. Mm -hmm. What and one of the reasons why I got into testing power supplies because it, if it's really bad, it is noticeable uh, in that the end result is uh, killing components. <laughs> um, so early on in my life, in my hardware life, uh, I was um, a head tech of a of an e-tailer, and I had to deal with a lot of RMAs. And we had a lot of system builders that would buy all their parts from us, but not necessarily the power supplies because we only sold brand name power supplies. They were too expensive, right? Right. So uh, they would buy like these twenty dollars power supplies, and uh, and then they come back after a year, and it's like my motherboard is dead, my graphics card's dead. They have swollen caps, burned VRs, and I'm like, what the hell is going on? You know, Sounds because like an emergency I room. never have these problems myself, and you're coming in here and like every motherboard you bought from me is now dead after only a year. <laughs> um, and sure enough, we tested them with a low tester and an oscilloscope, and found that the the ripple was higher than 120 millivolts, and the voltage regulation was like all over the place. It was plus minus five percent, which is within Intel spec. But if it's plus five percent within you know milliseconds, <laughs> right. right? You're driving those voltage regulators on your board absolutely nuts, trying to keep up and trying to maintain a, you know a stable voltage, right? To to actually run the computer. Yeah, yeah, that's a great explanation. Give me so closing out here. Give me uh, the if if you're buying, let's say a moderately high-end power supply, and you're looking around at reviews or trying to figure out what you should care about, uh, you, how, do you, how do you categorize the different uh, performance aspects of a power supply? So on Johnny Guru, you have the old rating system that yeah. you used to use, yeah. right? You talk about things like presentation. I think you talk about cable quality occasionally. Um, so, I mean, first thing is always performance, mm -hmm. and that's like the heaviest way to score. And that's going to be your voltage regulation, ripple suppression, um, but you know another thing that you know we weren't able to test for because these low testers are so loud, mm. and setting up a good soundproof uh, room or box or whatever it can be expensive is noise, and that's something that is a, a big complaint with customers. Right, um, is is the noise of the power supply, not just fan noise, but also coil whine too. Um, and coil whine is hard to capture, be, capture because we're we're do, using different technologies to switch these power supplies in ways that they're more efficient. But mm. unfortunately, that introduces more of that audible noise through the magnetics on the power supply, and that's what's generically called coil wine. Right. Um, but yeah, poor performance, you know, just overall performance, sound, whether it be, you know, coil wine or fan noise. Right. And then, of course, just feature set. You know, does it have enough PCIe connection? How long are the cables? Are they long enough for the case you're going to put it in? 
um, single versus multiple 12 volt rail. We were, you know, talking about you know how multiple 12 volt rails are a, is it's a safety thing, right? right. And how uh, all of our power supplies that either have a mechanical switch that switches between multiple and single 12 volt rail, or you can switch it in the software. We always have it a multiple 12 volt rail by default. Right, um, for safety. For safety purposes. user wants to throw caution in the wind and set it's single 12 volt rail, hey, that's up to them. That's their right. choice. But at least their machine is up and running. We know they didn't pinch a wire inside the side panel of the case and causing a short that would cause a single 12 volt rail to <laughs> overload and start melting wires just right. because arc of weld. <laughs> yeah, you arc weld your uh, side panel to your case. And, you right. Know. So, um, so those are the things to really look for um, overall. Um, yeah, and then of course, you know, aesthetics are good. You know, are, are a big thing. The cables, how right. well the cables can route and, and manage. Mm -hmm. That's when you get into things like fully modular versus semi modular. Fully modular, obviously, easier to do cable management. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, if you want to learn more about power supplies, and hopefully you do, check back soon. Subscribe if you're not, because we're going to be working with, I think, this exact equipment or something very similar. That's yours. <laughs> well, there you go. So check back soon for that. Thank you, John. I appreciate it. All right. Thanks, Dave. We'll see you all next time.